Okay, so now we're going to do a second example uh, where we're going to apply the uh, envelope theorem to uh, an economic situation. And this is going to be what's called Hotelling's Lemma. Now, before I get into the details of Hotelling's Lemma, let me say a few words about Hotelling, about Harold Hotelling, who was an important statistician and economist back a long time ago, 1930s, 40s, 50s, uh, before my time. Uh, he uh, was a professor at Columbia University in New York, at least during the early 40s, I think maybe throughout the entire 40s, if I'm not mistaken. And uh, he was a professor of statistics and economics, but he was housed in the economics department. And a first year graduate student at Columbia, who was living at home because he lived in New York and Columbia, living at home was the only way he could afford to go to graduate school because he got no support, no financial support during his first year of graduate school, was Ken Arrow. And so Ken Arrow wa became uh, perhaps the most important economist of the 20th century, and even up to the 21st century, except who knows what's going to happen the rest of this century, uh, one of the most important economists of all time. And so Ken Arrow was beginning his uh, graduate program, he was in his first year and he wanted to get support, he was studying mathematical statistics. And uh, there was nobody in the statistics department that either had the funding or would take him on, and he found out about Hotelling, a statistician in the economics department. He went to Hotelling, Hotelling took him on as a research and teaching assistant, and uh, so he had support, and that was the beginning of Arrow switching over from studying statistics to studying economics, and that's where he became an economist. There's actually a fascinating interview of Ken Arrow uh, that was conducted with him maybe uh, perhaps 15 to 20 years ago, I think. Uh, I'll, uh, I'll uh, give you a, a link to that uh, uh, on my website uh, in, the, in the notes for the, uh, for the course. Uh, it's fascinating about, about his time as a graduate student, how he came to be an economist, how he came to do uh, the Nobel uh, Prize uh, winning work on social choice and individual values and his other work. Uh, fascinating interview. Okay, <laughs> back to the details of, uh, of uh, our envelope theorem and its application to Hotelling's Lemma here. So we are going to be looking at a firm. In fact, this is going to be a kind of generalization or a little extension, I guess, of the price-taking firm example that we used to begin uh, our lecture on the envelope theorem. So our problem is going to be to maximize profits. So we have a, we still have a, a price-taking firm and the firm's profit function, we'll write out uh, in detail here the variables and parameters uh, and So the variables, the, the firm's decision variables are the output, just like in our uh, beginning example, but also the levels of two inputs to use in producing the output. And over here in the parameters, we have the price of the output and the prices of the two input goods. And I've used W's for these prices because they're kind of standard notation people use for input prices in this context. Uh, everything that I'm going to do here I'm going to do for just the two inputs, but that's we could have done it for any number of inputs. I could have just had vectors in here, but I think it's a little clearer if we keep the individual goods, so I'll just have the two input goods and their prices. Uh, we also can do this for more output goods. That's a little different, and so I'm just going to do this with the one output good. Our profit function then, uh, we can write it explicitly. That is going to be uh, the price times the quantity, that's the revenue, the price of the output good times its uh, production level, minus the amount that's spent to obtain the two inputs. So that's the profit function. And uh, now we have a constraint, which we did not have the first pass 
through the simpler version of this problem. So let's put our constraint in here. And the constraint is uh, that this is the production function. And the constraint tells us that uh, we have to choose input levels that will generate output via the production function at least as big as Q. Now you could say, well, why is that in here? The Q is up here and the inputs are in here. The production function isn't, but maybe you don't need that. Well, actually you'll note that uh, if I didn't have this constraint here, I could choose both of the input levels to be zero. And I could choose the Q to be really, really large. This would all drop out because I wouldn't be spending anything on inputs. Revenue would be huge, and I would be getting a very large profit. But of course, that's not really possible to produce output without using inputs. So we need to have a constraint here to make this uh, a good representation of the real situation, that we haven't left something out. In fact, here's another kind of aside. Um, I used to teach um, linear programming and uh, decision modeling uh, at the undergraduate level a number of years ago uh, for, for quite a few years. And in teaching that course, one of the things that was really important to get across to the undergraduate students in modeling a decision situation in order to bring analysis to that situation was exactly that you have to always be checking to make sure that you haven't left something out that makes the problem not really sensible. And so if we left out this constraint, this is the kind of thing that the students in, in that course would often leave out. If you left out this constraint, you, you have a maximization problem that's really kind of meaningless, right? So the constraint here is important. And so uh, let's say, let's define uh, G of Q, X1, X2 to be a Q minus f of x1, x2, so that our constraint now is that uh, this g function has to be less than or equal to zero. So I've defined it to be this, and this has to be less than or equal to zero. So that's uh, an alternative way of writing that constraint. And so now let's look at the envelope theorem applied to uh, this problem. And notice that the value function, of course, the variables of the value function are the parameters of the original maximization problem. So they are P, W1, and W2. And let's even just point out then that these are, that's the vector of parameters. And so this gives us, uh, it, this is profit as a function of the parameters. Uh, oh, and also let's point out too that, uh, that here is kind of in parallel to something that happened uh, in the previous example with the utility function, demand theory. Here, the, this G function, the constraint, doesn't have any parameters in it. I only have the decision variables in the constraint. Let's put in here. There are no parameters. That's perfectly okay, uh, just as it was uh, with the utility function, where the utility function, the objective function in the demand theory problem, uh, had, had no parameters in it. Here, the objective function has the parameters and the decision variables. They're all in there, all six of them. But uh, in the constraint function, we don't have the parameters. That's okay. The derivatives, of course, with respect to uh, the parameters will be zero here, and that's actually going to show up. So let's now apply the envelope theorem. We have the partial derivative of the value function with respect to the output product price. That's going to be partial of pi with respect to p 
minus the Lagrange multiplier's value for the single constraint times the partial of G with respect to P. Well, the price shows up in the objective function and the derivative of the objective function with respect to the price is Q exactly like in uh, our little uh, price taking firm example at the beginning of the lecture. But now we have a constraint in the problem and so we have minus lambda and what's the partial derivative of the constraint function G with respect to P? That is zero, as we just said, the parameters don't show up in the G function. So this is just Q. And in fact, that Q then is the, of course, that's always going to be the solution to our maximum, to our constrained maximization problem for any particular output level. And so we could write this actually as Q hat of the parameters. So this is actually the firm's output or supply function as a function of both the product's price and uh, as a function of the input prices that it has to pay to get the output produced. And of course the other parameters are the input prices. And I'll just do the same thing for each, each of the input prices. This is going to be partial of pi with respect to wi minus lambda, partial of G with respect to WI, and that's going to be what's the derivative of the objective function, the profit function with respect to WI, that's going to be minus XI. What's the derivative of the, uh, and of course here we have minus lambda times the derivative of the constraint function with respect to W, and again, parameters don't show up in the constraint function, so that's zero, so that drops out, and so actually here I will just uh, erase this from the screen, since it's zero, and we have just minus xi, and of course that would be xi hat of p w1 and w2, so this tells me that the partial of the value function with respect to an input's price is just the negative of the amount of that input that's being used optimally at the parameter values that, uh, that pertain to the problem. This is what we would call the input or factor demand function for the firm's maximization problem. So here we're again looking at a profit maximizing firm uh, and a price taking firm, uh, but we've kind of generalized a little from our initial example where we could include the, uh, the, the input decisions, input prices as parameters, and the production function. So what we're going to do in our last example is we're going to not look at a profit maximizing firm, we're going to generalize to a firm that might have some other objective function, could be profit, could be something else. So we'll take this off and we'll get to our last example.